Today we hear a very familiar scripture reading this time of year, a very familiar piece of the Christmas story. Interestingly enough, out of Matthew 1, we are starting with verse 18, but the 17 verses before it, more verses that we didn't read than what we did out of chapter 1, we get the genealogy of Jesus. It is an inspiring list of who begot who, who begot who, which would move us all to share the unconditional love of God just by listening to it, or at least settle us in for a long winter's nap. Yes, in Matthew's version of the Christmas story, we start with 17 verses of ancestry. Chapter 1 is devoted to the ancestry more than the angels, the ancestry more than information about Joseph or his response. It is devoted to ancestry more than it is to the actual birth of Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, we get the genealogy of Jesus, and then a brief note about an angel's visit to his dad, and then the visit of the Magi. Not a lot of details on the actual events of Jesus' birth, so we're left wondering what Matthew is trying to tell us. Well, he's letting a Jewish audience know that he's writing, that he's writing about them, about one of them, that Jesus is Jewish. He's being born into their context and into their relationship with God, making sure we know this is the God of Israel at work, not some unknown God, not some new God, some other God. This is the Lord of creation who has been and will always be with them. Chapter 1 is devoted to ancestry, putting this story in the context of history and family, of history and family. And in it, we get a couple of characters who I know I have overlooked before. Joseph's father and his grandfather. They don't do anything in the story. They have no role in the plot. They have no actions or verbs beyond begotting the next generation. But their names are there. His father, Jacob, a very common name not the Jacob we know from the Old Testament, but Jacob, a name passed down from generation to generation, expressing the faith and their connection to those who came before them. And his grandfather, it's Methan or Mathan. Mathan's easier for me to say, so I'll go with that. What did Joseph's father and grandfather have to do with our story? Well, we assume they probably had some influence on Joseph, right? We assume Joseph might have asked them for some advice. We assume that even if they are dead, they shaped Joseph's ethics. Joseph knows Mary is pregnant, and he's planning to dismiss her quietly. He has compassion for her and does not want to disgrace her. He doesn't want to embarrass her. He certainly doesn't want to bring harm to her. Before the angel has ever visited, Joseph has decided, discerned, determined that this is the path to carry out. Joseph looks at more than the letter of the law with his strong morals. He's willing, even as the story unfolds, to listen to an angel's dreams. Are these traits, are these morals that come from his family? Is Joseph a product of Jacob and Nathan and the unnamed mother and grandmother who were part of raising him? Did he know them personally or just through the stories of family? Usually we romanticize these Christmas stories. We fill them with the warm fuzzy of the holidays rather than the hot mess that they really were. We talked about this last week in our study time after worship, that the real Christmas story was a total hot mess for everybody and continual. But we celebrate it by creating warm, fuzzy moments, trying to keep there from being conflict, trying to hide our hot messes in the name of a story that was everything and more that you might imagine. We take these stories on face value and then move on to the warm, fuzzy but today, I want to invite you to think about Joseph, to think about his birth family. How do you think they felt about Joseph getting married? Were they excited? Were they proud? I wonder what expectations they had for Joe before all the drama. Maybe imagining him growing up to be a carpenter like the men before him. 
raising a family like those who came before him, passing on their family traditions, customs, their values, and their ethics, their faith, the faith of the family who came before him. I wonder what expectations they had for Joseph before the angels got involved. And then after that, after the news, after the revelation that Mary is pregnant, how do you think the family felt about Joseph's bride? How do you think they felt about Joseph staying with her? Did they believe the couple's stories about angels? Did they believe the couple's stories about the role that Jesus would come to play? Did Joseph even tell them the whole story? How often have we left our family in the dark out of embarrassment, insecurity, or just not wanting to go through the fight, through the struggle, convinced that they will judge us anyway, they'll come to their own conclusions anyway, or that they will love us anyway? Did they support Joseph no matter what? Or was this the end of the story for Joseph and his family? We really don't know. Jacob and Nathan, along with the unnamed women of the family, they're not in our story. They're not present. They are absent when Jesus is blessed at the temple. A story, a tradition, a ritual of faith that the grandparents would have normally been a part of. Instead, Simeon and Anna will eventually take their places in the scripture story, standing in the place of those lifting up a child for blessing, affirming their value, their blessedness to the community of God. We don't know what happens to Joseph's family. So we're left to wonder, did they come to expect more? Did they come to accept his decision? Did they come to accept Joseph's family as theirs? How did Joseph come to terms with this decision? Did he have to let go of family expectations to go his own way, to be his own person? Or were family already dead and him wondering, wishing he could have a conversation, thinking, what would dad say? What would Grandpa Mathan advise? How would Grandma have handled this? We don't know. But each of us has similar choices to make in our life. Maybe not the dramatic scene, the complexity that Joseph faced, but maybe just as dramatic or intense in our own way. How do we make our choices, do what's best in our life, to be who we are called to be while still honoring the values we are taught? How do we reach beyond the limits of our family's bias or their understanding of their time in history without abandoning relationships or our place with them, our identity? How do we find peace with our decisions and keep the peace with loved ones? How do we find peace with our decisions while keeping the peace with loved ones? It's not an always an easy path to navigate. I'm sure Joseph probably questioned his own choices a few times. I'm sure Joseph probably heard family lectures, either in real time or at least in his head from time to time. But in the end, Joseph makes a decision. He stands by his convictions. He stands by his partner. He stands by his faith. Joseph knows peace, at least in his heart and mind. Over the next few years, his family, this young family, will know very little peace in the world around them. Traveling for the census from Nazareth to Bethlehem, the story of a baby coming into the world as a blessing but in the cold, then running for their lives to Egypt as political refugees, immigrants, immigrants in a strange land, far from the support of the familiar, and then the coming home coming back anew to an old place, old expectations, old stories, old rumors of Joseph and his bride and the baby they bore in Bethlehem. I wonder what it was like to try to find peace of mind and peace in their hearts through that journey. As we travel, as we connect and reconnect we may be aware of the expectations placed upon us. 
we may just look back in our memories and feel the expectations of a bygone time still resting firmly, squarely on our shoulders. As we connect, as we reconnect in this holiday season, may we find peace with the choices we have made. May we find peace within our hearts. And may we find peace with the living God who dwells and journeys with us. Amen.